Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. Good morning, friends. Uh, I am recording this lecture after a gap of two weeks. In the last lecture, we tried what is the conventional way of getting an idea about what will be the gross weight of the airplane for a particular mission requirements. And we were clear that we are talking about fuel, maybe ATF, typically combustion dependent engine was in our mind, whether it is a jet engine, whether it is a turboprop, we are talking about fuel, fuel, a conventional fuel, oil, have gas, whatever way uh, they are being addressed to. And the question is, what are I was doing last two weeks. It is interesting that last two weeks we were trying to launch one of the UAVs designed here along with a private company. We are trying to test it at high altitude, around six kilometers. And we were looking for a particular rate of climb, particular endurance, particular range. The difference was, we were testing UAV which was supported by electric power propulsion or I say to be more specific, battery driven propeller engine. That means I am having a motor, battery power, it gives power to the shaft and shaft has a propeller and rotates and gives the thrust and it propels. It is important to mention at this point because you will find in the previous lectures we were bothered about what is the fuel fraction required. So that I have an idea how much fuel I have to carry for a particular mission. Why that is important? Because I need to not only know that my airplane will have sufficient fuel available, but also as a designer if I know the amount of fuel, I need to locate an area, a volume in an aircraft, maybe near wing, maybe in the fuselage, where I should be able to accommodate that amount of fuel. But if it's the battery driven, then the story is different. Then I need to look for a volume where I can put the battery. This is extremely important because there is huge amount of work going on in developing propulsion other than the conventional propulsion mechanism, basically the energy part of it. So in this course, I will try to cover whatever limited knowledge I gathered in electric power propulsion, especially motor, propeller, battery combination, so that you have initial understanding how to look for better and more precise knowledge on those topics because this is going to be electric power propulsion is going to be the order of the day in coming years. We have also worked on solar power and we have been flying regularly one of our solar power UAVs last one month or so. So some aspects of solar power also will come in this course. Very limited, I repeat, very limited so that it motivates you to do, to read more. But why today I'm mentioning all this thing is the type of experience I got, type of experience I got through limited failures, we, although we had success, but there were 15 to 20% failure and for me, that failure 
was more important than the success we had. And I want to use the, these understanding, this knowledge, so that our design people can, especially youngsters, for experienced people, this may be very trivial, but for youngsters, they should set themselves right from the beginning, as far as possible. You know, in last class, we have been talking about particular mission requirement. Where we have takeoff, climb, cruise, loiter, landing. There's another term which is important is the rate of climb. Whenever you design an aircraft, you have to specify a specified service ceiling, which you know when you say service ceiling, we say it is that altitude at which the rate of climb maximum is ROC maximum is 100 feet per minute. Therefore, when you are designing an EOV, if you have not incorporated this feature in the airplane, as per the customer's choice, that design will not be acceptable. For example, if I am designing a, let's say, a a 5 kg UAV, fixed wing UAV, and I specify its service ceiling should be 6 km from the mean sea level. Service ceiling is 6 km from mean sea level. That means at 6 km, the rate of climb maximum should be 100 feet per minute. This is a mandatory thing. Although we don't cover all this thing here, you see I will be going on adding these features. Sometime I'll be talking about accelerations limit, right? So I thought I'll be sharing with you, this has a huge importance because you know, when I talk about the rate of climb, how do I perceive? If you go to performance doors, we said, if this is my power required, and this is power available, then these are the speeds which will give me particular rate of climb because I know TV minus PV, uh, TV minus DV by W is equal to rate of climb. But the assumption is I am climbing with a constant speed and also I know that when I am calculating power required, I am taking it is as if it is cruising, indirectly I am telling this graph is valid for power required for a small climb angle because the climb scale will be less. So this also I interpret as P available minus P required by W. Let us understand, if I really want a good rate of climb, I should fly somewhere where this is maximum, this gap is maximum. So corresponding to that speed, I should fly to achieve rate of climb maximum. At the same time, I should ensure that this speed should be more than the stall speed. Your stall speed is the minimum speed at which you can make the airplane fly level and straight, unaccelerated. Now see, who decides the power required should be less? This is, you know, drag required into V. So who decides drag required should be less? I repeat, if I want to make this gap more, I have two options. One is I ensure that power required at every speed is relatively less and power available is relatively more. Then I have a wider gap. So I'm focusing on power required. If I want to see the power required is less, that means the drag required for a given speed should be less. 
And what is the meaning of drag required being less? If I see drag required if I want to be low, then drag is nothing but half rho v square s c d naught plus k c l square. So for a given dynamic pressure, you could see that if I want to really minimize drag, then I have to handle C D naught. This gentleman should go, and this contribution should also go down. How do I handle C D naught? C D naught, you know, C D naught has a skin friction drag component primarily for a subsonic airplane. So I try to make it streamlined. I try to ensure that the surface is smoothened. There are less pressure losses, that is, flow should not suddenly jump out. And all those things, suppose, the, suppose this cross section is like this and flow is coming like this, a lot of losses will be here. Similarly, if there's a lot of roughness is here, that will lead to skin friction drag. So what we do? You see, in design evolution, with this understanding, attempts were made to make a streamlined body. So in doing that, especially for wing, you have found out that lots of aerofoil shape have emerged. Right? So this is that was the requirement for aerofoil. So we'll see how aerofoil shapes have evolved and what was the designers looking or expecting from those shapes. Now coming to the second part here, if I want to reduce KCL square, which is the induced drag, I need to reduce K. How do I reduce K? You know, for a subsonic, it's fairly good model for pi aspect ratio E. So if I increase the aspect ratio, then the value of K will reduce. And if I ensure that the wing shape is conforming to an elliptic leaf distribution, then I can get E value as 1. And the question is, if I want to increase the aspect ratio, we want to make it more and more. For example, typically, aspect ratio for this sort of an aircraft if you are designing, which are flying at 100 meter per second or 80 meter per second, that is 160 knots roughly, the aspect ratio will be 8, 9, around that. But if you are talking about a glider, it has to be more because you want to glide, right? Indirectly, or a clever designer, he will talk in terms of Another parameter called wing loading, WS. If he's designing a glider or designing a UAV or an aircraft which has good gliding ratio, he will say, gentlemen, I want to bring W by S as low as possible. Right? But then there is a problem. If W by S is low, it may become too sensitive to wind also. So those sort of a trade-off will go on. Since we have already talked about how to estimate W0, takeoff weight, visa vis a mission requirement, and now we realize that I need to ensure I have selected proper aerofoil for the purpose that it is lift efficient or lift to drag efficient, that is, we'll be talking about. CL by CD to be as high as possible. So if I now focus on aerofoil, what a designer would look for the attributes which will help him, depending upon what flight regime he is flying. If I am talking about low subsonic, then if I see an aerofoil, I will check for CL alpha to be fairly good. Although I know the CL alpha is limited by the fact that it can be maximum 2 pi per radian. 
Then also I look for at what angle aerofoil stalls. Because you see that I have an aerofoil, something like this, which is a cambered aerofoil, CL versus alpha. This slope is the CL alpha. But another point is, as I go on increasing the angle of attack, the CL increases to a limit at which the airfoil will stall. The airfoil stalls mean the wing stalls. Wing stalls means your aileron, which are sitting on the wing, are also ineffective. So not only there is a loss of lift, increasement in the drag, but you lose control as well. So you have to avoid that. So a designer will wish, oh, this point could be somewhere here, somewhere, somewhere here, to the extent possible. That means when to delay, stall, delayed. Whether the stall angle is higher by characteristic of the aerofoil or artificially or externally you use some mechanism so that the stall is delayed. But the designer wants by this way or that way if the stall angle is delayed he will be happy because he can generate more lift. So this is CL alpha, stall delayed. And when I say CL alpha, you could see here, a uh, designer also would look like, look for a good value of CL max. He wants CL max should be as high as possible. Why? Because if CL max is high, then V stall, which is 2 W by S, Rho CL max. If CL max is high, then V stall is low, so he is happy. So when he goes for a takeoff, landing, he is fairly comfortable because he can get the smaller value of V stall, so less power will be required, less takeoff run will be required. So he always wants. Can I have a higher CL max? Typically, CL max value for conventional airfoil will be around 1.2. But you have seen, people want to increase it. So one way is you contour the aerofoil so that CL max goes by implicitly by because of shape. Second thing is people use flaps, right? For example, if this is normal aerofoil, dry part of a wing, so they put a flap, the wing, if I see the wing shape, some part here, this is like flap, so that increases CL max and these are used during takeoff and landing. These are not to be used during cruise because in any case you do not require a lot of CL in cruise because the moment you put the flaps down you will understand the drag also increases so CL by CD also goes down generally. So you don't like that. And for cruise, anyway, you know that for cruise, I can write thrust equal to W by CL by CD. If I want for cruise thrust to be minimum for a given weight, what I should do is I should fly at a speed, at a speed V such that CL by CD is maximum. So if you could cross check your notes, if this is your CL by CD, CL by CD versus V, there is a particular V at which CL by CD is maximum. And just to revise you, CL by CD maximum for thrust required minimum, that means CL equal to CD naught by K, right? And you also know that if I go on increasing aspect ratio, then we get an unrealistic value of CL. If that CL, the aircraft may stall. Right? So these are 
few things you must uh, understand before you go into the aerofoil. Also, what is important for you at this stage to understand, this is a typical observation and I thought I must share you at the beginning. If you are using a propeller driven engine, then you know when I talk about thrust, there is something called static thrust. something called dynamic thrust. You can very well understand the very mechanism of thrust developed by the propeller without going into any equations or any technical term. The propeller developed thrust by pushing the air backward. Okay. Now imagine the airplane is moving. So now, propeller has to push lesser number of, already air is going, into, going through this propeller or whatever uh, disc we assume. So in that process what happens, the propeller doesn't generate the same thrust as for a static case, right? Little bit of I add, physics to it, as the propeller rotates with some RPM and moving forward, it induces angle of attack, right? Omega R by V. I'll be talking about propeller, I think it's important. But if that angle is equal to the pitch angle, then net angle of attack becomes zero, so it will not be able to generate any thrust. So the issue is when you are designing a prop-based airplane, you must see that your dynamic thrust will fall and there will be a particular speed at which the dynamic thrust will be zero, right? And whenever I am writing thrust equal to drag or drag or lift equal to weight, please understand this we are talking about dynamic thrust, the thrust develop at that speed. Scenario is not similar for a jet-driven airplane. For a jet-driven airplane, thrust roughly remains constant with the speed. Not that drastically changes like a propeller-driven airplane. This is also an important thing you should keep back of your mind. Another thing that we have revalidated and learned in a harder way, what we found was in high altitude, we carried out tests. Say six kilometer. And that time, we could easily climb up to six kilometer. And almost six kilometer was the service ceiling for the UAV, what we are testing. And this was conducted in winter. Then we again repeated this trial in June. We could find, we could only, for everything remaining same, we could only go up to 4.5 kilometer. That is a service ceiling, almost 4-5 kilometer you could achieve. It is obvious that in winter the density of air was more. And since we are using same propeller, density of air was more, so the if you see here, this power this power available was also going down in the month of June where temperature was higher because density of air was less. But you may question the power required was also relatively less in terms of in winter because density was less. But what happens? If you see, the power available goes down very fast. So your excess power availability becomes questionable. Right. And also, you could see if I was getting a particular rate of climb at this V. This is very important. 
in winter. Right? Say at 6 kilometer. As I want to get similar performance at of same rate of climb, then what will be the V? Of course, V will be this V for new altitude or temperature will not be equal to V star required in, in the old one. Old one means here it is winter, here it is summer. Because in winter, the density is more naturally. You require lesser relative speed to generate lift. But for a summer, density is less. So we need to generate those same amount of lift because weight is same. So you have to fly the machine with a higher speed. right? And which goes with the ratio of densities. You know that. So whatever was V star here, you have to fly perhaps somewhere here. But now imagine. Let us say, because of your design and constraints, when I'm talking about winter and summer, I'm talking about the speeds being different to maintain the level flight or maintain any operation which gives similar output. If I see a simple case of cruise, so half rho summer into V summer square into S, into CL, I fly at same CL, let us say. This should be equal to W, which is same. It's half rho winter, V winter square S CL. And I'm flying at the same CL. I'm having same areas, same weight, everything same. The key point is rho summer and rho winter are different. So what will happen? V summer required will be half hour goes off, it will be rho winter by rho summer into V W square or V S or V summer will be V W into rho winter by rho summer. I'm assuming C L is constant. Why CL constant? What is the meaning of that? Suppose I want to fly a drag minimum. For that CL is steady naught by K under root. So that CL is fixed. right? But it says if you want to fly same configuration, same CL, then the, because density of air in summer less than density of air in winter, so to get the same output, the speed and summer should be more than speed at wind. By how much? By the square root of this ratio. This is important. Now suppose, because of some constraints, already you are flying here in Vista in winter. Right? And now you want to duplicate this in summer. Then summer means now this V star, which was V wind, in summer, it would be Vs, which will be more than V wind. And it so happens, it may happen, that V summer may come summer here. If it comes here, what is happening? This is power required. This is power available. What is happening? The moment that V is here, which is crossing this point, the power required is more than the power available. So the machine will start decelerating. And it will start try to come here. It may exceed by inertia. So there will be oscillation in the UAV. Like this. Right. Most of the UAVs, you will find it is difficult to fly here, where power required is minimum. This condition is close to power required minimum very close to, right? And power required minimum means, PR minimum means CL equal to under root of 3 CD naught 
by k. And this value for a high aspect ratio machine, this may go between 1.5 to 1.7. And most of the UAVs, normal configuration, this is beyond the stall angle. So we do not really find conventionally fly here and automatically try to fly somewhere close to this. Or what you do, you select a power so that this gap is huge. The moment you want to put powerful power, the weight increases. Again, speed changes. So these are the challenges which we face and we'll be facing in a normal aircraft also. I thought of sharing this experience so that we know now what will be the roadmap for our next series of lectures. If I summarize, you could see that first part, what we'll be talking about is very simply the aerofoil. We must look for, do I understand what sort of aerofoil I require? This is also important, please understand, why I'm talking about aerofoil, because whatever flying machine we make, these are primarily designed with an understanding that if I give a nearly horizontal motion to an aircraft or to a body, it will be able to produce a vertical lift force, right? Unlike a helicopter, where you rotate like this, it gives a vertical force. Here, you move horizontally and you generate a vertical force. That is where the aerofoil plays important role. Also, we know, when I talk about speed, if I am low, low speed, and you try to increase the speed so that Mach number, let's say free stream Mach number goes to 0 0.75, 0 0.8, something like that. What is the danger? Danger is, if this is my aerofoil, some shape like this, you could see here, the flow which comes, it turns here, and how much it should turn so that a lot of energy is not wasted, that will be decided by nose radius, right? Suppose I am flying a supersonic machine, so I want a supersonic wing. Wing. So I will prefer this portion to be a pointed. Because you know, it will generate then oblique shocks, right? Not a normal shock. A blunt nose will create a normal shock. But we restrict to ourselves to a subsonic. So, so when I talk about aerofoil, I need to know what should be the nose radius. Also, you see, if this is 0.8 Mach number, and across this, because you know, by continuity, the speed will go on increasing, right? As it goes on increasing, it is possible at some point this may go to one, Mach number may become one. And the moment Mach is one or near one, there will be shock wave, a lot of loss of energy. So you do not like that. So aerofoils are characterized by another term called critical Mach number. If you design a aerofoil, and if you are operating around 0.75 or 0.8, you need to know what is the critical Mach number of the aerofoil. Meaning thereby, what is, what is that free stream Mach number For which, for the first time, at some portion of the airplane, it achieves Mach equal to 1. First time. Now the question is, you want to fly at a higher speed? So what the designer would do? Designer will pose this question differently. He said, what should be the aerofoil shape so that I have got high value of critical Mach number? So the designer's question will be, designer, What is that shape, aerofoil shape, for which M-critical is higher? 
And when you answer this question, you find the new generation of aerofoil, a super critical aerofoil, came into existence. Came into existence. We'll be talking about these aerofoils in detail. And this is just to prepare yourself. We'll be going core into aerodynamics, but in a designer's perspective. Do not start reading books now. Okay? You whatever knowledge you have got, just glance through, and we we are trying to synthesize as a designer. Also, you will see. When I'm talking about aerofoil, one question I'm asking for a high speed, what is the critical Mach number? I'm asking what is the nose radius? Because if the lift is because of differential pressure between the top and the bottom surface, then nose radius should play an important role. Also, I'll be looking for what is this T by C, that is thickness to chord ratio. Whether it is a thin, whether it is a moderate, or whether it is a fat aerofoil. You will see that they behave a little differently aerodynamically. They have relative advantages in terms of storing fuel. All those things will get summarized. So we'll also look for T by C. Another important thing we'll look from or expect from an aerofoil is at what angle is going to stall. That means, which you know very well, as flow accelerates here, the pressure drops, and, and somewhere there is a generation of adverse pressure. Because of adverse pressure gradient, the flow separates. We'd like to know what is that point at which the pressure coefficient, which is nothing but the non-dimensional signature of differential pressure, right? What is that point at which the pressure coefficient becomes zero? So I know I have come to a critical point. Beyond that, things will be different. So I would like that location to be far aft. If that location is instead of here, if it is here, I am very happy. That means I know. The moment there is a pressure drop to CP drops to zero, beyond that the flow will start separating around that. And that is what I am looking for. I would like that flow should not separate at all. So as a designer, I would like this point where the CP, the pressure coefficient is zero, should be as backward as possible. Right? And with this, so that my stall angle also increases. Critical Mach number increases. All those advantages we'll get. So we'll be talking about that also. And when you talk about that, when I'm saying flow should not separate, then I'm actually talking about laminar flow. So that drag is low. Conventionally, if you see here, there is an adverse pressure, pressure gradient. Now you could see, as you draw a line like this, the area goes on increasing. So the, the speed goes on decreasing, so the pressure at P1, P2, P3, so P3 is more than P2, P2 is more than P1, so there is an adverse pressure gradient. That is primarily responsible for flow separating. So if I want a laminar flow for a longer chord length, I like to ensure that for a longer length, it, the adverse pressure gradient should be handled properly. The pressure should not be adverse so that it doesn't make the flow separate. So how to ensure that it doesn't have that detrimental adverse pressure gradient for a particular chord length will also decide what type of aerofoil you want. And since I have just talked about those numbers, next class I will be talking only about aerofoil. What is the nomenclature of aerofoil? How do you read an aerofoil? Once the nomenclature is given, what are the information you get so that you can easily synthesize this into your aircraft design? Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>